firstly in terms of setup, secondly in terms of what happened in the immediate aftermath, thirdly in terms of what the immediate devastating consequences were, fourthly in terms of how this led to the development of ethnic tensions within the border, fifthly about how why this was bad for the territory surrounding Russia, sixthly on how this cut off the aid to develop the world, and fucking seventhly how this obviously gave America a huge amount of power and that is bad. Firstly, in terms of setup, what do we actually think the decline and collapse of the Soviet Union looks like? That is, firstly, events that happened during the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example, the invasion of Afghanistan, that marked things that were, you know, decided at the beginning of the end. They caused an incredible amount of loss of life and destruction. They caused incredibly bad, uh, you know, bad impacts. The collapse obviously means breaking the uh, Soviet Union up into separate states. Note the fact that things that happened at the very end of the decline, for example, glossiness, I mean, glossiness are not something that we need to oppose. So that kind of transparency policy is something that we would support. That is something that's okay because it was at the very end of the decline in the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. First point is to stand up about what happened in the immediate aftermath. Two things to talk about here. The first thing is that things that have once been nationalised or now privatised, the impact of that were devastating. What's to talk about here? Firstly, in terms of things like electricity control. They were sold off to the highest bidder. It meant that people in the, in the Soviet Union were, you know, it was incredibly difficult for them to access basic goods and basic services. Things like natural resources were sold off. That meant it was incredibly easy for a very small amount of people at the top to get access to an incredibly large amount of resources. The impact of that is that these people's power was entrenched and they virtually took control of Russia. For example, having the oligarchs in Russia meant it was much easier for someone like Putin to have a path to power because it made it much clearer for him. The impact of that is twofold. Is firstly, the exploitation of consumers is like outrageous. Obviously, they have no access to things like reliable electricity, things that they need to make their day-to-day -day life far easier. You know, poor people were incredibly fucked over. Secondly, though, because foreigners bought up so much of these resources, it meant that they could exploit their own wealth and, you know, it just created an incredible amount of misery and devastation within Russia. Second point of substantive is about the immediate devastating consequences to daily life, that is, the people who were living in Russia. The first thing to say is that the health system nationally completely shut down in that it was sold off to the highest bidder. That meant it was incredibly difficult for people who weren't at the top end of the economic system to access basic health rights. That meant that people still now have lower life expectancies if they're living in Russia. It means that six in every ten women have an STD when they live in Russia because of the collapse of the health system in that time. Do not underestimate the incredible amount of human misery that was caused by the collapse of the Soviet Union. No. The second thing to talk about is in terms of the crime wave. That is not to be underestimated. People literally dying on the streets, people dying and being killed in incredibly violent and incredibly unjust ways that we ought to oppose. The lack of a real, a real state to protect them, that they had nowhere to go to and then they had no support system, that is obviously bad. This was particularly bad, though, for ethnic minorities. Violence against Jews, violence against Muslims who were living within the border of what was previously known as the Soviet Union, they were incredibly hard done by, and most importantly, they had no one to go to support them, they had no state that could actually provide them benefits that they obviously needed. No. Next point is about how this led to the development of ethnic tensions within the border. That is because the failure of the state meant that there were separatist movements. That is, the state was poorer and weaker, it was far easier to get away with racist things, it was far easier to get away with things like ethnic cleansing. Like, for example, Chechnya, a region within Russia, thousands of people died now, like when the Soviet Union collapsed. If the Soviets had kept control of it, these people, maybe they wouldn't have been perfectly well off, they would have been kept happier, there would have been less bloodshed, they would have been able to help. The human consequences of this are absolutely devastating, they are absolutely not to be underestimated under opposition's work. Fifth point of substantive about how this is bad for the surrounding regions within Russia. The first thing to say here is that obviously the Russians are desperate to take back their territory. That is evidenced by the fact that they're doing things like fucking with Ukraine. They're doing things like taking over Crimea, things like the invasion of Georgia in 2006. Uh, in 2006. Obviously, they are all bad things that you know, are incredibly detrimental to those surrounding areas. That is something that we do not support. Secondly, they have heavy influences in other territories. So note the fact that opposition might try to tell us that, oh, well, now at least these places have independence. Oh, well, now at least these places have their own territories. Well, those fucking bang, bang on the table. Russia still has an incredible amount of control over these territories. They are the ones who know. They are the ones that have access, like Central Asia and Eastern Europe, access to like capital that allows them to control these areas, in particularly pernicious ways. Six point of substandard, but how this cuts off aid from developing wealth. 
first thing to note here is that, like, you know, co co like communist governments and po like communist governments that used to get access to aid via Russia, that was taken away from them. Like, you know, um, like things like using the Communist International Bank no longer a possibility. That meant that things like keeping North Korea in check, for example, is far harder to do. It means other communist, uh, you know, countries and territories and political leaders don't have access to the kind of aid that they needed. That obviously, and that meant that living conditions were not only worse within Russia, but also worse, worse internationally, materially. Living conditions went down. That is obviously bad. Final point is to stand up about how this gave America complete total control globally. Why is that true? Because if it went, that when the USSR collapsed, there was no counterbalance for USA. So that meant that they were able to go into other territories like Somalia, like Afghanistan, and like Iraq. If the USSR had not collapsed, they would have far less incentive to take over. Why is that true? Because they wouldn't. They would have someone who was countering them. They would have someone that was opposing them. They would have a force to balance them out. So even if the USSR, you know, was run down and corrupt at the time in which um, the US that took like took over these places, at least they still had allies. They still had military. Overall, they would have access in a better way. So at the end of this speech, with seven points, proud of the government. I should start this speech with three observations about opening government. The first observation I have is that the vast majority of their analysis is a bad thing happened after a point in history, therefore that bad thing is the worst thing that could have happened and happened because of it without explaining either of those things. The second observation I have about this team is holy fuck they're uncomparative. They're so uncomparative they don't even take a fucking POI. Like, their argument is just like, things were bad afterwards. Guess what, motherfuckers? Of course they were. Things would have been worse on our side of the house. We're not going to pretend like everything was sunshine and roses for us. But thirdly, they never talk about the fucking USSR. They don't explain why the USSR was good. They just say bad things happened without explaining why the actual institution they support, which led to millions of fucking people starving, was a good institution. Holy shit, guys. All right, I'm going to give you two arguments because seven is too many to demonstrate you need to learn how to organize your arguments. The two arguments I will give are firstly, why did the unique structure of the Soviet Union lead to enormous domestic problems that would have never been resolved? And secondly, why the Soviet Union existing was bad for the world? So you can organize things. First argument, why did this unique structure of the Soviet Union lead to enormous domestic problems? There are three unique aspects to the Soviet Union that do not exist in modern day Eastern Europe. The first is that they have a centralized political power structure. The second is that they were communist. And the third is that there were many countries united into one big bloc. All of those things led to very bad consequences and would have continued leading to very bad consequences. Let's begin by talking about the fact that they had a centralized political power structure. And let's be comparative here for a moment because we acknowledge Hungary, Russia, it's not great. It's far worse when it is A, objectively even more centralized in the you know, political structure and noting they want to model out the period of time in which things got more liberalized for some fucking reason. And B, it's also more centralized to the reason that you have many countries' governments represented by one central authority. Of course they had some degree of governance, but the central power was held in one government. Why is that so bad? Two big reasons here. The first reason is that leaders do worse things when power is centralized. That is for the reason that there are far fewer democratic checks and balances on them. There are far fewer ways that you can call that person out and kick them out of office because they have all the power and there is no way to hold them accountable. But secondly, it is bad for the reason that they are afforded far more power. And it means when they do have the whims to fucking waste all of the oil money on, like, guns instead of giving it to the people, which is what happened and led to enormous infant mortality and starving, they're able to do it, and they're able to do it at a far more widespread scale. The second thing under centralized power structure is the fact that there is no transparency under that centralized power structure because the Soviet Union removed all of the transparency. And that's a big problem because it wasn't until six years after infant mortality and alcoholism spiked to the point where it should have been an international humanitarian crisis that anybody in the world fucking knew about. So no one could criticize Russia and Russia had no impetus to do anything about it. Noting that I'm saying Russia here to represent, you know, basically the central power of the USSR. And that's also important because it means all aspects of international relations that could put pressure on the USSR to reform in the ways that they were failing their people did not work. Notably, powers like the United States and powers like China are more transparent than the status quo. And Russia today is more transparent than the status quo, which is the reason we have been able to sanction Russia. We have been able to put diplomatic pressure on them. Of course, Putin is bad. But guess who was worse than Putin? 
Stalin. And that is the exact structure that allows Stalin to exist. Putin, as bad as he can be, can never be a Stalin. Second, let's talk about communism. Communism has been tried many times and it has never worked. Jordan Peterson. Let's explain for a moment why it is the case that communism was a devastating economic structure for the USSR. There are two primary reasons here. The first primary reason is because all of their shit was fucking nationalized and because of the reasons I described before, there were none of the kinds of checks and balances that allowed for the efficiency of nationalization or the nationalization benefit of making sure it worked better for the people because the government wasn't accountable to the people and it was a highly bureaucratic and nepotistic system that didn't allow for the efficiency of nationalism. As a result, they squandered millions upon millions upon millions of dollars on themselves or on inefficient systems. And that's important because of course when you implement privatization, there is a short transitional period where it is inefficient. But in the fucking long term, Russia has gotten much richer and importantly, that wealth has flowed down to the middle class and the lower class in a way it could never before. Compare the rates of starvation, compare the rates of individuals who have access to healthcare, and you'll see it is clearly better in a system where capital has the incentive to succeed by being the best product on the market. Notice how there, like, in the years afterwards, there was problems with the healthcare system. A, insanely uncomparative, the healthcare system of the USSR was historically awful. But B, we can't just talk about the two years afterwards, we have to talk about the infinity that follows the fall of the USSR, which certainly favours our side of the house, as evidenced by the status quo. But finally, let's talk about the fact that they were united. There is a big problem with the USSR being a big conglomerate, which is the fact that it gives them far more bullying power, which they used constantly around the world, entering into unnecessary wars, bullying smaller states, and forcing their will on the international stage, causing an unprecedented amount of global conflict. That cannot occur when they are more atomized. And they're like, well, they still have a bit of power over Hungary. Just be comparative, good lord. Let's talk about what the counterfactual is in our side of the house, because there are functionally two counterfactuals here. The first counterfactual is, is that they stay as the USSR, and the atrocities that they were committing persist ad infinitum. But the second counterfactual is, is they simply get worse. And there's a bunch of reasons to believe that they would get worse. Firstly, because, and also note that I was not offered a PLI. Firstly, <laughs> the fact that the United States won the war and they were increasingly pressuring the USSR, which pushed them into a more dogmatic and scared approach where they were more oppressive to their people and they had to more desperately cling on to power because of the threat of revolution all over Hungary, uh, like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, which is something that these guys want to make contemporaneous to debate. But secondly, for the reason that Russia was in an enormous downward spiral economically. Inflation was higher than it has ever been before, and on top of that, they had squandered all of their national wealth on arms spending to fight Reagan, something that I will now address in my second point of substantive. Why the Soviet Union was bad for the world. There are two primary reasons here. The first is independence. There are 15 states that now have their independence, people whose principal right to having statehood is legitimized by the fall of this nation. This team cannot just Weighing that out of the debate as one of their many subpoints in their seven points of substantive. But secondly, and Shane's will expand on this more, there is far less global conflict now because you don't have two enormous nuclearized powers constantly threatening to put the world under ash. That is certainly a benefit for our side of the house. There are far fewer proxy wars, there's far fewer uh, less ideological aggression from the USSR, and there's less aggression from the United States in response. The world is more peaceful, these states are more economically prosperous, and the world is more liberalized in a world without the USSR. Surely, we do not regret their decline. By the standards of an Ollie Common speech, it is truly nuts for him to try and ignore the fact that every single harm and ident uh, that Abella identifies and brings you was a direct result of the collapse of the Soviet state, of the fact that necessarily it had to be dead ahead the state, necessarily had to split into a number of smaller states, from the fact that it necessarily was no longer communist and therefore had to sell off a huge amount of assets. That is the causal link that Ollie completely misses. Five things in this speech. First, I'm going to establish causality, more than I've just done that intro. Secondly, on centralised power. Thirdly, on communism, more broadly. Fourthly, on the world. And fifthly, within a lot of material that just goes completely unresponsive. So first thing on the matter of whether or not the collapse of the Soviet Union and maybe the ramifications afterwards were necessarily a causal relationship, I think there's three reasons to believe it has to be. Firstly, you have to reduce the size of the state at the point at which you are literally splitting it into separate different states. Obviously, that is going to impact how the states are able to run their national systems like healthcare, like offering police force and like, you know, literally any form of government services. 
Secondly, you necessarily have to, have to transfer, some, transfer some of your services to the private sector at the point at which you are nationalizing it. Not only because you no longer have the wealth to run it as a nationalized service, but also because the, nation, the oh, Soviet yeah. Union was necessarily and explicitly no longer communist. But thirdly, you had to wind down a huge amount of military spending as well. Obviously, at that point, a lot of the problems that arise from a lack of infrastructure, from a lack of war and order at home, are directly related to the collapse of the Soviet state. That is why that push from Ali does not work. Secondly, then, let's look at centralized power. I think <coughs> Ollie suggests that the centralized power structure of the Soviet Union was far worse because it allowed for Stalin, it allowed for more oppression of the people within the borders of the Soviet Union. I think there are four things to note in response to this. Firstly, as Bella tells you, a lot of these countries are free in name only, a lot of these other countries are now free in name only, even Russia itself is still very much under like, the iron rule of a, an effective tyrant, right? It is incredibly obvious to anyone who looks that people do not win elections with 85% of the vote, people do not have, like, their, all their political opponents mysteriously die all the time. All of these states are very much still authoritarian, any benefit they want to try and claim there is incredibly marginal. But the second thing to note is that national governments are more than capable of all of this type of leadership. As Bella describes, Putin himself does all of this with the explicit backing of the oligarchs and the elite within Russian society because it is mutually beneficial for them. It is in no way and good enough for OO to claim, well, the structures would allow for better, leader, for better leadership because they empirically have not and know that this is a regret debate. Thirdly, uh, thirdly, I would note that importantly, even if you believe they're material and believe that people do have a better quality of life now, which, uh, which I'll explain is, uh, is false in the next piece of substantive, even if you believe that, that, the enormous number of people who died during the decline and collapse of the Soviet Union that Bella describes to you, the people that in Afghanistan, the communist governments and people around the world who stopped receiving aid money from common terms, the people within the borders of the Soviet Union, the people in Chechnya because the Russian state was no longer strong enough to stop an uprising in the separatist movement, all of those people dying is so much comparatively worse than a few people, than the people surviving have a very marginally smaller amount of oppression in their daily lives. That is not at all comparative. That is not engaged with in any capacity by by nation. Sure, I'll take closing. Do you think that China under Deng Xiaoping would have been able to implement free market reforms if they had an incredibly strong communist USSR on their border? Yeah, I absolutely believe they do, because the Sino-Soviet split happened 30 years earlier. They were obviously not aligned at all at that stage. That doesn't make sense, particularly, as a, as a POI. Secondly then, let, uh, thirdly then, let's look at communism in this speech. Oli contends that communism is in, in the Soviet Union was incredibly inefficient because there was no checks and balances and no accountability, which led to a huge amount of like, squandering oil wealth, for instance. And this is entirely correct. The Soviet Union was a corrupt gerontocracy. The problem, though, is that having a functioning but corrupt and inefficient state is so much better than the alternative, which we tell you is exactly what happened empirically. The state totally collapses. That is the reason that you have things like life expectancy in every former Soviet state currently today lower than it was in like 1985. That is the reason that your one, one in every six Russian women has HIV. That is the reason that you see all of these long-term disasters that have catastrophically ruined people's lives. There's a reason that so many, like, you know, one in every six male deaths in like the former Soviet Union is alcohol-related because the people there are miserable. They have no hope. The government has completely failed them. They are on their own. That is why that push doesn't work. Oli also makes the truly fucking crazy claim that wealth has now flowed down. And I don't know where he got this idea, but like, as I've just talked, like, like all the measures of inequality literally don't apply to Russia because of how far off the scale it is. They like, literally don't even have the data on how much oil wealth the oligarchs of Russia have. Vladimir Putin is speculated to be the richest man in the world. Those life expectancies for all those middle class people Oli tells you about has continued to decline or remain stagnant. Incomes have not gone up in Russia for decades. This is a truly fucking crazy push. Life is materially worse for literally everyone other than those oligarchs now than it was under the Soviet Union, even if the, even if the Soviet Union was, technically speaking, more authoritarian. Finally then, let's look at the world. We get two pushes from OR here. The first is that independence is broadly good because these nations now have like sovereignty and self-determination. Like, what are you talking about? Lukashenko is in charge of Belarus. You have literally just replaced one dictator for another in the vast majority of states. Look at all of the Central Asian oil producing countries like Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. There is literally no material difference there. Well, the, the only actual concrete difference is that you now have a much weaker state that is influenced by Russia to the exact same degree that almost nothing has changed, but also you are incapable of doing things like putting down insurrections within your country. That is why Chechnya has been in a pet state of near constant civil war for nearly 20 years. That is why South Ossetia and Georgia keep getting invaded, because these states are incredibly weak and incapable of repelling Russian, uh, Russian aggression. 
The second push we get then is that there is less global conflict now because the Soviet Union has collapsed. And I think this is just empirically untrue. The reason that the Cold War was a Cold War was because there were a relatively small number of hotspots where conflict flared up during that, you know, during that 50 years. That is why you had Korea and Vietnam taking up so much you know, attention of like, you know, the partially irrelevant superpowers. The, the, the decline of the Soviet Union and all of it means that you now have more things, as Bella explains to you, like Iraq, like Somalia, like Afghanistan, because the US no longer feared having to do with competition, no longer had anyone to deter it. That is why it was so capable of committing to basically being imperialist, because there was no counterbalance, there was no check. That is obviously regrettable. Finally then, let's whip some material that we literally just don't get a response. We tell you about oligarchs and how they've entrenched themselves in the political system of the former Soviet Union, particularly Russia, to no response. We tell you how the quality of life for people as a result of worse healthcare, crime, and even starvation because state provision of just basic essential goods for to sustain life got exponentially worse. We tell you about ethnic conflict in the former Soviet Union. We tell you about how surrounding na nations surrounding Russia now have a far worse time of it, like places like Crimea. We tell you about the lost age of the developing world that literally would have killed hundreds of thousands of people. And we tell you about the US in fact becoming a worse actor. Open opposition have not engaged at all with the material Bella, material Bella gives you, and that's why we take this debate. It decides in its context when it suits it. Because in one breath, this is the powerful, Stalinist, Khrushchevian Soviet Union from the 50s and 60s, and they're incredibly powerful and stable. But know that they were the ones who were committing the absolute worst atrocities. And then later, we're in the 70s, where there were already revolutions fomenting in a huge number of the battle states of the United Party, uh, the, the Soviet Union, and yet there's no mention of that in any record at all. So, whatever they choose, both pills are poisonous, let's deal with it. First, on military and foreign intervention. Secondly, on the Russian people themselves. Third, on power structures. And fourth, on the way it affects other states. First, on foreign intervention. We know there are four mechanisms why you get fewer foreign interventions on behalf of Russia at the moment. The first is you just have a diminished military capacity. That is because a lot of your tanks and stuff literally just got dismantled. It is because a lot of them remained in other vassal states like Tajikistan, which you can no longer access. It's also because you no longer produced them because after a revolution, you are no longer interested in producing military items. Second, there is a period of internal turmoil from 92 to 2000 where they just aren't producing anything at all. Third, there are fewer geopolitical bases and fronts for a track, so if they withdraw, for instance, from their territories in Syria and Turkey, some of the very few like areas that they still retain control of are, for instance, support in Iran, but a lot of that territory they control in the, like, akin to the way that the United States controlled Guantanamo Bay, they were forced to withdraw it because they were no longer that state. Finally, there was less appetite for aggression because your ideology was not fundamentally incompatible with this other empire that you utterly despise. What are the impacts of that? It meant that there were just fewer terrible foreign interventions like Afghanistan in the 1980s on our side of the house. This team responds in two ways. First, they say people were killed in Chechnya. First, first, note that a lot of the vast states you guys describe had ethnic tensions that were not like ignored as apathy by the USSR, but were fomented by the USSR. So if you look at the Serbs and the Croats in Bosnia, it was a tool of political control by the USSR to foment them in order to gain control. When you get rid of that in the 70s, you don't get the ethnic tensions in the first place. Dave. Um, and if the counterfactualists actually claim that the Soviet Union just becomes worse, why wouldn't it just collapse again in the future? Okay, that's our plan, and we think it'll be worse. We've got a whole argument about that. Brilliant. Second, they talk about the invasion of Crimea. Uh, three things to say here. First, no one died in the invasion of Crimea. A lot of people died in the Great Leap Forward. So if we're going to weigh comparative benefits here, we think ours were a lot bigger. Second, the international repercussions have been swift for Russia. They got absolutely censured and required to give the territory back in Georgia in 2006. A terrible example for you. But third, our claim is it would have been far worse if you still wanted these places, you still claimed the areas of Europe in Central Asia or other areas but you had the weight of capacity to invade them and more of an appetite to invade them. Be comparative. The next claim they make is that the US has global control and that would be bad. Three things. First, Russia remains sufficiently powerful as in China to be somewhat of a counterbalance as in other states. Second, the US in this period you're describing consistently sought assent from the coalition of the willing. Look, for instance, at the Gulf War. Look at the way that they required uh, like, like UN Security Council verification for the wars they committed during that time. Third, this would not stop the United States. All you do is get Vietnam or Korea again, where now in the Iraq or Afghanistan war, you have the USSR giving weapons and funding to the fucking Taliban. So it's like the worst idea. You want to make the Iraq war the even fucking worse. Jesus Christ. So the wars that did occur came worse. Finally, you get imminent nuclear war. Five reasons. First, nuclear warfare almost broke out a number of times. Well, for instance, the Brzezinski uh, nuclear silo and submarine crisis. 
a, a few other reasons. Second, they had the capacity and the will to do so based on the ideology of brinksmanship. Look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we became seconds away from such a thing. Third, the fervent ideology, which means you legitimately believe that you are the good guys and thus that you pulling that trigger wouldn't be bad. Fourth, you had the rampant veneration of aggressive leaders, people like Stalin, which means that doing it is consistent with your ideology. And fifth, the power to use nuclear weapons were concentrated at a very low and plentiful level. It was people who operated nuclear submarines. It was people who were in particular bases. And look, all you need to believe is that there was a little bit greater chance of that half of those five structural reasons, because this has to be the biggest time of the If this team has a 2% more, more like likely chance for this to happen, they're going to lose, we're going to win. Let's have a talk about the Russian people. We give you a series of pieces of analysis about communism specifically, and why hot blasts and the way in which centralized structures occurred were particularly bad. There's no specific incentive to any of that specific stuff. We tell you that at least a minimal agency for individuals, because the collective goes the whole, the whole. I'm going to add here, the USSR was incredibly homophobic, and we had like entrenched its fundamental ideas that you could not be religious. And look, Russia has a series of homophobic problems at the moment, but at the very least it wasn't instant death penalty immediately, no matter what, no matter if you belong to any of these much broader sects of society. So those things seem much worse for the most vulnerable people in society, that, uh, and there were a few incentives to train and educate people. Let's now talk about the aftermath, which is what this team wants to talk about. The first thing to say is that, yes, there are oligarchs in our world, but you guys have complete capital saturation and centralization in the absolute top elite there. At least in our world, you can own capital, you can own a home, you can own a business, which you could not do in your world. Note as well there was rampant corruption throughout the United USSR at that time. The only other response the privatization of the goods and health system requires is to point out these are short termists and have to be smaller scale and impact on other harms in the debate, thus I can rewind to them. The next claim I want to make is that it will collapse anyway. That's because the underlying issues remain. You have the same saturation, you have the same shared economy, you still have the same fundamental issues of populist with respect to organizing labor, you still have the same within vast states. So, as David hopefully helpfully points out, that means it still falls, you get all of your harm. But it doesn't fall with Gorbachev doing the NIC transition in 1992. It falls five years later with someone who's toppled from power because they're definitely trying to hold on to the USSR itself. Which means you get way worse privatization. You get more people killed in that particular transition of government. We then give you some information about the unique power structures. The response we get is about democracy. I want to note a few things here. First, you had a blanket policy of state censorship in the USSR in the 1960s and 70s, which means you could have no criticism. You guys know of Alexei Navalny, you could not have an Alexei Navalny in your world. So even though the like, level of accountability is not perfect, it's better in our world than in your world. Finally, an independence and the way in which it affects other states. First, a huge number of countries received direct independence, the Balkans, Central Asia, etc. The counterfactual is that they could not have. The response we get is, well, they are still controlled by these sorts of groups. A few things to say. The first is it is still better because at least you have some elections, you have some power, you have some independence. Second, this is untrue. Bush did the, the Bush senior did the new Marshall Plan in the 1993 to 1995, which flooded those with, with a huge amount of money by the IMF in order to lift them out of poverty, in order to remove them from the sphere of USSR control. The next thing to say is that they just established regional incentives for aid, for instance, the Balkans from the EU as well. So that means that those people got the right to vote, those people got independence, those people were, were no longer under the victim of state censorship in the way that they described. So, an enormous number of things with very, very high impact proven from opening opposition throughout the vote. Firstly, opening half of this debate fundamentally generate a false comparative. Because the comparative they talk about is a USSR which is already in decline and which is already failing. Because the topic is about regretting the decline of the USSR, the features that caused those decline are not the thing that we should be comparing to, but to a new comparative which would be the basis of our extension. But secondly, it is unlikely that the counterfactual is just a world where the USSR gets even worse and then five years later it just collapses. And the reason for that is because this debate is about regretting the decline. Because those aspects of decline still occur, that means the counterfactual definitionally cannot be an instance where those things that were declining just keep declining and then just end up to that flux five years later. We need to imagine a new world where that decline never happened in the first place and that will be the thing that we will bring to you today. And lastly, in terms of Oli's idea that the state will just, you know, get worse. I think the idea is that if the state just got worse, it would have broken up 
prematurely because of the fact that the USSR relied on a fragile union of 11 states that had to be bought in with the promise that the system would work. The system did not work and would not work under their counterfactual so that USSR would have broken up anyway and would have been unsustainable. So, in terms of the counterfactual, the first thing I want to prove is that the USSR, with this condition that it was in, inevitably would have broken up and cannot be the counterfactual for five reasons. Firstly, because there were intrinsic economic incentives through the centralization of the USSR which prevented proper economic growth. The Soviet Union used a system of targets and quotas which meant that, for instance, if you set a, like, a target on like, how like, many sheets, metal sheets, a factory needed to produce, they'll just produce small sheets. If you set a target for how large those sheets had to be, they'll just make them really like, thin sheets. And if you set a target on like, how like, thick the sheets had to be, they'll be very wide. And those systems were very, very misplaced. But secondly, there was a political fear of repercussion because those political institutions were so trapped and resentful. Because of the fact that people didn't want to report that they didn't meet those targets. Because of the fact that they knew that they might be repressed and put into gulag camps. But thirdly, there was a step, step on innovation because the system feared creative destruction. Because individuals were unable to innovate because all the money flowed into centralized system. But also, individuals feared that their sense of innovation the economy or technology would be against the ideology of the USSR. Fourthly, it is a geographically sparse country, which means that a centralized economy that wasn't liberalized was hard to control everything. And lastly, the constant comparison to the US and how good it is. Now, you might be wondering, why am I just proving why the USSR is bad? That is the fault of our opening team. Our claim here is that the only counterfactual where this USSR would not have collapsed and would not have declined is one where they actually adopted more liberal economic and political reforms. And they would have done this for several reasons. Firstly, by adopting democratic reform and having systems of accountability and justice, were they able to erode these systems under the decline of the Soviet Union, where there was accountability and people were able to have that innovation. But secondly, they will likely adopt economic reform because that was the thing that was able to win over the populace, right? They're likely to open up and become a more stable actor. Think about the way that China has, for instance, over time realized, you know, the socialism didn't work and then adopted to become a more stable, open actor. No, this response to opening opposition, because the degree to which we fear nuclear weaponry from the Soviet Union is far greater than the degree to which we fear nuclear weaponry from China today, because even though China is definitionally a nuclear state, it is a state that is one that is far more economically open and has economic interests that are tied with the US, which means that they have more to lose if they use that nuclear weaponry compared to the counterfactual that OG talked about. What that meant was that they would have this economic reform that made those political and economic institutions far, far more liberal. And we see this is something that was already happening in the status quo. The Glasgow's try to open things up because bureaucrats recognized that this was a problem that needed to be solved. Our contention was this was done too late and far too little. And the only imaginary world where the Soviet Union would not have declined and collapsed was if it did those reforms fast and quickly. And what does this mean? It means that you get those economic reforms, but it also means that it feeds into the tenet of that Soviet ideology because the communists, like the reason why those socialist states often became authoritarian is because you need that initial authoritarian push to centralize the economy, right? But after at which the economy has been centralized, over time the imperative for overriding democracy becomes lower and lower. But also the economics of our counterfactual, which is say the political and economic reform which would have brought weight to the people, would have led to more organic liberalization. This has several very important benefits. Uh, and, and just like if you didn't understand the mechanistic analysis, just pretend this is a state which is a bit halfway between the Soviet Union as they describe and Norway today, right? It would have been a pre socialist state, but it would have been relatively liberal and one that has mechanistic link through. There are a few benefits to this. Firstly, we give you a tangible example of an actual socialist experiment that has happened which incorporates the best parts of a left-wing economy, but is also relatively more liberal than the ones that opening Taft talks about. And this is obviously important because firstly, it makes the lives of those people together better, which obviously is a benefit that opening claims. But secondly, it is a challenge to capitalism, and that challenge to capitalism is important because right now, the world has capitulated to capitalism because they think the great socialist experiment has failed. That means any socialist reforms get labeled as communistic, but it also means things like corporate capture, things like environmentalistic destruction, things like rampant wealth inequality just continue inevitably because everyone bows down to them and says, this is 
the lesser of two evils of the two systems because this system never worked in the first place. And we can take it one from you guys. Um, but the last thing to say here is that it would have had a better influence on modern uh, socialist regimes, which is to say that like the reason why China is so authoritarian today is because it feels like the like the limited like political reform that the Soviet Union made like in the glass Soviet period didn't really work, and they're also trying to manage an economy where they're trying to centralize everything but keep people at peace, and they feel like the only way to do that is actually crack down on people. If the Soviet Union actually emerged as a model which was relatively more free in its political and economic institutions, that would have actually inspired countries like China and Vietnam and North Korea and all those socialist regimes to not adopt this approach and go with our approach instead. And this cap, like, preemptively just destroys CEO's extension before they even spoken up, because I presume their extension is something about China. Our one, our extension is one which is hard to imagine, but you have to look to the mechanisms, which is the idea that this well only would have happened, that decline only never would have happened if that liberalization occurred. OG is like, like, like the other teams are not debating the topic because they're talking about a Soviet Union where the mechanisms for that decline have already occurred, and they use that as the basis of their arguments for why the Soviet Union is so bad. For these reasons, we are very proud to propose. Yeah. <laughs> 
that many would get worse for the people. First, as I've mentioned before, enormous military spending, it had to increase hugely. Like, missiles, etc., are being incredibly expensive, but also, like, propping up proxy governments in Asia are also enormously expensive. You have to supply them with military technology so there isn't some, like, great capitalist globe that they are terrified um, of happening. But second, and extremely crucially, we are going, if the USSR persisted, you would get far worse leaders because if we prove it gets more hardline and militaristic, that means the leaders will be far more radical who come into power. And that means they're not going to care about the people at all. They are solely concerned with their ideological objectives about ensuring that the nation like, doesn't suffer to capitalism because the military does not experience the harms that people in Russia experience. And they are able to simply say um, that this is like, they can justify it through the global cold war they have with the United States. Um, but thirdly, I also just think like a significant benefit is just that the United States no longer has to be so, so right-wing because often the right-wing government is voted in for their foreign policy, which literally counters the left-wing policy uh, or the communism of the USSR. If we show that deteriorates, then we also show we get better governments in the Western world overall, I would say. The second harm then we're going to prove is why this will lead to far more proxy conflicts, which I would not, not only kill innocent people, but deprives them of the opportunity to form their own nation and self-govern and have autonomy. And the USSR was, like, the crucial context here is the USSR was instigating proxy wars in Vietnam and Korea. With that said, what other reasons why proxy conflicts, which weren't provided by open opposition, get far worse? First, like, it's, it's literally not even all about the USSR. The US was the country which most commonly invaded other nations and caused them to suffer. That looks like things like Nicaragua and in Central America. And the reason they do this much more often when the United States is in power is obviously because they're paranoid about like, another communist power which equals their military strength. But also, like, the USSR provided some tanks to North Vietnam. It provided no soldiers. The USS reaction was like chucking in a fucking army and a bunch of tanks. Clearly they had a much, not only greater capacity to cause conflict, and that only happened when they had a global enemy to do it against, but also they were more likely to do this. This literally just provides double the instances, I think, of open opposition in terms of how proxy conflicts actually occur. Um, but secondly, it also means that countries have an incentive to revolutionise because they believe they might get aid from, uh, from, from the USSR because now they are ideologically aligned with them and that might accrue some level of sympathy. Obviously that harm no longer occurs. Um, but, it, it, yeah, but, 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 uh, I should say before I run out my system, yeah. Yep. Who? Yeah. Which one? Close it. Um, so if everything you say about communist regimes is true, how did China become more economically liberal in the United States? As you point out, was one of your like teams on your government actually point out these are totally different situations with the Sino-Russian split. <laughs> like China was not in a cold war when it fucking economically improved. Like yeah. those are the harms, uh, those are the harms there. Okay. But also, the crucial principle impact here, which is mentioned briefly in Oli's speech, is just that you are deprived of nationhood, and a nationhood coheres of like a pre-existing collective unity, which these countries have, and also a racial and linguistic sim similarity, which exists in these nations. That is deprived of them when Russia or the USSR is actively uh, instigating wars within their nation. That violates all their principle, or, or all their principal rights of first dignity, second their right to self-determination, third their right to not be oppressed and be in conflict. But also, this is just analogous, uh, like. Uh, we can analogize this to colonization, but like even if it was worse for those nations initially, we would still have them be free, because obviously we do not want them um, suffering uh, under that. Finally then, the third half on why this makes major global conflicts much more likely. The reason is obviously just because we have demonstrated that a variety of proxy conflicts are also going to exist. But not also, we're gonna provide the crucial context. There are much more spark points in the modern world for how a, like, a global catastrophic conflict could occur. Like for example, cyber warfare is now much more prone. If cyber warfare leads to a breakdown in communication, that is much more likely that like, you could see the harms of nuclear war. But moreover, you just have everyone um, in, the, in the same battlefield. You also have three superpowers, China, Russia, and the United States, which just obviously leads to more conflict because of the tensions between them. And for those reasons, we're incredibly powerful. The system in which they operated under was the best one in the world. That it was one that other states should aspire to. That it was one that preserved the lives and dignity of people while still upholding the crucial tenets of that kind of ideology. That was why it was not that far-fetched to suggest that there would have been some level of economic and political liberalization by the USSR had they not declined, had they been able to secure themselves still as a superpower that continued to exist, uh, and, and even though teams wanted to stop at that, we did not think it was that far-fetched to suggest that at the, if, at the point at which in current history they started to decline, if instead they had ended up not declining, that that would have been for a few reasons uh, that, that, 
primarily revolved around that kind of opening up, uh, opening up, which means that we are able to answer to what opening opposition demands of, of, of government bench, which is that we look beyond the immediate aftermath, which is that we look beyond just the global impact that, that well, America is a superpower. That, oh, sorry, that threw me off. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the America is a superpower that is stronger now, and that is a bad thing. We actually give you an active reason why preserving the USSR as a competitive superpower on the world stage is actually an active good thing, and a lot of that goes unresponded to. So, firstly, uh, just to, to remind you, David does actually give you some mechanisms as to why the USSR most likely necessarily would have had to adopt at least some level of liberalized democratic reform if they had not collapsed and if they were to still support themselves as a superpower in the ongoing state. Uh, he tells you that it is necessary for them to win over not only their population but also the world more broadly, since obviously part of what they want is to prove their system is one that can work elsewhere, that it is one that should uh, uh, expand and people should want to opt into it, that it is one that people are happy under. If it is true that all of the things that they were doing would very clearly have inevitably led to that kind of decline, then the alternative method that they would have used would have been the one that they saw was working in kind of comp competing superpowers, which is to make those kinds of allowances here and there, know that this is not to say that it would have necessarily happened immediately and, and to the fullest extent, but we do think that they would have slowly started to introduce those kinds of reforms, and once they started to introduce them, and once it kind of, kind of clearly started to work, and, and they saw that it was not necessary for them to have those terrible kinds of crackdowns that OO wants to tell you will necessarily occur, then they would have done so likely at an accelerating rate. We give you the example of, for instance, China that economically liberalized, that's not to say that it would have happened in the exact same way, but that there are often incentives to economically liberalize in, in some shape or form gradually to interact with you, obviously with the world that continues to exist around you, but for instance, politically in places like South Korea, obviously not exactly the same again, but the point is to say that South Korea increasingly democratized as they saw that their initial small steps towards that liberalization did not actually lead to their crumble and it actually secured a, a, a lot of the values that they stood by, that led to that kind of increase and accelerating democratization and allow them to remain competitive on the world stage. We tell you that particularly the imperative for authoritarianism uh, after entrenching the initial system and kind of securing it to some extent does largely go away or at least decreases significantly if it is true that they are in this position where they are competitive globally as recognized as a one of the three major superpowers or whatever uh, and, and what they want is to then continue to slowly advance. We think that that stability Point. combined still with the overall ideological goal of advancing their kind of ideas would likely mean that the imperative, the initial imperative for authoritarianism slowly kind of decreases and that interacts with the growing need to then uh, kind of appeal to obviously the remaining rest of the world who does not operate under your system right now and, and to appeal to those kinds of states. We think then what is good about the, the USSR kind of acting in this way is that they provide a really helpful socialist experiment and a challenge to capitalism that is an actual example of how socialism can work successfully in a regime that is at least slightly more liberalized. Yes, it is true, as our opening says, that it's bad that the US has so much power right now, perhaps, but we think that that is only reasonably challenged under the kind of counterfactual that we imagine, which is that they would have provided that example that no other state is able to kind of uh, offer to the same extent today. We think that's the reason why a lot of the criticisms, for instance, of socialism and, and the ways in which it inevitably crumbles are able to uh, to remain strong in the status quo. And we think that it's important that there is a powerful state that is able to challenge that, right. which is why we disagree that it is necessarily true that the USSR gets worse for all of those reasons. Like, you can't be like, oh, if they don't decline, then they will do all of the same things that exactly led to that same decline. Obviously, it is likely that they would have uh, attempted some kind of other approach, and we told you with David why this was the most likely approach. Uh, uh, not to say that it was maybe the only one, but the one that they were likely to have taken for to avoid that kind of decline. The kinds of reasons why the USSR would have gotten worse than only in Seamus and you were part of the decline. We tell you that in order to have avoided that, those things could not have occurred. They would have done something necessarily different different, which also responds to all of the claims that they give about how communism was bad for the USSR. Uh, obviously what we're saying is that the way in which that communism would have continued to play out would have been different to the way in which they ran it, that led to that decline, or that they would have seen that imperative shift if they maybe continued to do it for a few years after maybe like the 
point in time in history where we think the decline started uh, occurred, but that they would have recognized that that was leading to instability and that it was not actually securing their power Last in chance. the ways in which they thought. And what that would mean is that they would likely uh, they would likely be forced to take that other approach instead. That is why we thought that, 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 that this was the actual likely path of the USSR as a superpower in the global stage. Finally then, to talk about what CO brings you about kind of uh, how they would engage in more proxy conflict and things like that. By the kind of analysis that we give you as to how the USSR would have likely behaved in this counterfactual, we think that that part of that economic and political liberalization, however small or however slow, would have led to things like initiating more trade and that kind of stuff would have eased nuclear tensions for the reasons that we give you. We think also that the need to come across as a more rational power, as a more sensible power would have obviously also aided this. But we also think that if it were true that other states recognized that as a remaining superpower, the USSR had huge capacity to, for it, like if, if it's true that other superpowers would have been afraid of them because they had the capacity to do things like incite or fuel further tensions, the rest of the world obviously under that counterfactual also has an increasing interest in engaging that state in rational and, and kind of diplomatic talks and in relations and securing them as part of a network of global superpowers. We think that uh, we think that the USSR that would have survived is one that would look fundamentally different to what this government bench wants to imagine we propose. I'll start this speech by talking about what the counterfactual is, then I'll talk about how we win the opening half clash, and then I'll talk about the material about global conflict that we uniquely bring you in depth at closing opposition. So, what is the counterfactual? Closing government's big extension lies on their fleshing out of a counterfactual that we think is quite implausible. They give two reasons to think that we're going to get a nice, sort of big, cuddly bear of the USSR. The first is that in a setting of global competition, there is an incentive to be nice. Unfortunately, this is falsified by the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and <laughs> the 1980s too. But also, it's like, if you think about it, it just means there's more incentive to be ruthless and do as much as you can to expand your global share. For instance, like, I know it's probably the most relevant debate, but all those different meal delivery ones, like, they're all competing on, like, fairness or anything. They're just being ruthless as shit. The second thing they say is, if the USSR was ruthless, there is no way it could have survived because ruthless states die out instantly, as evidenced by North Korea, Cuba, or Sikhism in history motion, baryonic Egypt. And they say, it's like, oh, and they say, and, uh, sorry, and we would say that it is also more likely that liberalizing leads to collapse. One, because even if you're providing them with good services, these sort of periphery states, they still want liberty because they still have their own like national like uh, identity, etc. So if you give them more freedom, they're just going to want to break away, therefore no USSR. Second of all, if you do liberalize and you show weakness, you're far more likely to get destroyed by the USA. Not that they invade you, but for instance, as Bennett said, when they do that sort of Reaganite thing where they ramp up defense spending to force the USSR to match, they'll have to try and keep up, and they cannot do that at the same time as being liberal. They cannot spend more on the military without having to take costs to citizens. They can't do, they need to do both in order to survive, they can't do both. Instead, what we brought you at closing opposition was a very plausible account of what would happen. That is, you have certain people at the top who currently have total power, and they want to keep that total power. So what they do is they ramp up defense spending to match the USA, they increase the centralization of their power, and more importantly, more belligerent people are doing better because in the context of an increasingly expansionist USA, it is only the hawks that can survive in the bureaucracy of the USSR, and so you end up with a more belligerent crop of leaders. So actually the counterfactual does not fall to closing government, it falls to closing opposition. Let's look at how this factors into opening half, because basically the opening half big contention is mostly about the well-being of those in the current slash former USSR, depending on if we're talking about the counterfactual or the real world. Basically, we think our counterfactual wins this because we say they survive by being really mean. The government survives by being really bad and belligerent and militaristic, which means that living standards necessarily have to take a fall in terms of the restriction of people's civil rights in order to entrench the power of the elites, but also in terms of the, of the economic restrictions that happen when you have to increase military spending to match the USA. But also we would note that this is by far the, like, it, it certainly isn't the most important point of the debate, simply because of the, pr the principle that Bennett made, which is that given that the USSR was to some degree the colonial enterprise, we probably shouldn't care so much about the well-being of those in the former imperial core when the imperial enterprise backfires. We should probably care more about the victims of their imperialist enterprises overseas in the core, in, in, on the periphery of their empire. So, before moving on the issue about conflict, I'll take a point of information from opening. Millions of people in the former USSR and allied states died in excess mortality during the decade of total state collapse and two decades of oligarchs entrenching themselves politically and cannibalizing the former state services 
expensive or not. Uh, yes. Can you please uh, make a parody about the amount of human suffering? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. So I will clarify, we were in the room when you said your case. Like, also, our counterfactual self self-responded like awful things, we think there are certain forms of order that are more tyrannical and worse than chaos, but also we show how they apply in a long term. Also, it might just end up collapsing in 50 years, right? Which point all of your hearts come into yeah, yeah, yeah. activation. So let's talk about conflict. Two areas, proxy conflict and global conflict. On proxy conflict, opening opposition shows to quite good detail that the USSR is not going, but sorry, now the USSR hasn't collapsed, they're not going around starting any proxy wars. At closing though, we observe the fact that most of the proxy wars during the Cold War were not started by the USSR, they were started by the USA. And so we said that one, the USA will increasingly do proxy wars given that there is an even stronger USSR to oppose. And this, crucially, bypasses all the closing government stuff about how actually the USSR is going to be really nice. Because even if they're being nice, the fact that they are strong and the fact that they are a rival to US hegemony and ideological dominance means that the US has still has an interest in terms of ruining the governments of Nicaragua, of Chile, and of any country that like my fucking dart lands in when I throw it at a world map. But second of all, we notice that a significant number of these proxy wars start not because the USSR decides to meddle in a certain territory, but because there are certain revolutionary groups that start on the belief that the USSR will support them once they gain power. And what that did was it drew the USSR, even if it was a really nice government as closing government hopes, into these conflicts. So what this means is, uh, you know, we get way more proxy conflict, which is really important, because, for instance, you get things like Indonesia, where a million people were slaughtered by the government. One million is a pretty big number, yeah? And it's probably more than ended up dying in the collapse of the Soviet Union, assuming only on, on our side that the Soviet Union ends up collapsing. It's probably going to collapse in the long term. So you get way more proxy conflict, way more death, way more instability throughout the world. But also let's talk about global conflict. Opening opposition makes intonations about this by talking about nukes. Basically, the analysis is there are a lot of nukes lying about the Soviet Union, there are a lot of people with control over those nukes, God knows what will happen. Uh, we, we, however, have three more persuasive reasons for why you get global conflict. The first is that there are simply far more potential clash points, that is, in terms of the analysis on there being more proxy wars that happen, which we mechanise far better than you, Seamus, but also the fact that there are many theatres evolving, for instance, things like cyber war, which Bennett brought you, and Seamus certainly didn't bring you. <laughs> there will be more belligerent leaders of both countries, because, per our analysis on the counterfactual, there are worse leaders in the Soviet Union, which means it's more likely to have, like, you know, worse people there. So, for instance, a lot of the flare-ups were stopped, and I'll move on from that, but also worse leaders in the USA, who are going to be doing more that ends up provoking them, and there will be less lines of communication, more likelihood of conflagration. But third of all, there are far more weapons developed because, as we said, there's going to be increasing weapon spending, where each side keeps trying to outspend the other one to oblivion. Per the topic, they survive this. What this means is we're not just talking about nuclear warfare, we're talking about things like cyber warfare, but also things like biological warfare, and sort of like, I don't know, like, in the 1920s, most people didn't know nuclear bombs were going to be a thing, and given we stopped trying to develop world-destroying super weapons at the end of the Cold War, who knows what world-destroying super weapons we might have? That sounds kind of bad. Maybe we'll end up like blowing the earth out of its orbit or something. At the end of this debate, closing opposition gets above opening government, because to the extent they show harm, their harm sort of apply on both sides, but also they only apply to a select group of people that are far smaller than the group of people that we talk about at closing. Closing government, where our impact should blow them out of the water, and for opening opposition, they win the opening half, hell yeah, we really like them as guys, but we mechanise the ideas of conflict so much better and so much more devastating effect that that's why closing opposition takes its debate. Woo!